Hi everybody, this is Mr. Matthew, and this is the first of four videos on biological evolution. Uh, this video is part of a series to help students get ready for the MCAS exam, or the uh, State Assessment for Biology in the state of Massachusetts, and is based on the uh, 2016 standards that were put out, which are heavily aligned with the Next Generation Science Standards, or NGSS. If you're a student in Massachusetts, hopefully you'd find this is helpful. If you're not a student from Massachusetts, um, there is pretty he heavy overlap between the Massachusetts standards and the NGSS, but there are some subtleties, so you might want to check with your individual teacher. In this video, I'm going to talk about evidence of common ancestry in biological evolution. Over here, we have a picture of Charles Darwin, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how he came up with his model, but we're actually going to start with a little bit more modern view, and then we'll work our way back to sort of the types of field observations that Darwin made. So when we talk about common ancestry, we're, it's important to mention the idea that all living organisms on Earth are considered related back to a universal common ancestor, sometimes referred to as LUCA, or the last universal common ancestor. And the idea here is that if we look at all the evidence uh, that we're going to put together in this video, it suggests this common ancestry for groups that were more recent, and as we go more and more in the distant past, we'll be able to link all living things back to LUCA. So our first piece of evidence we're going to look at is molecular evidence. Now molecular evidence could be DNA, it could be RNA, it could be proteins or amino acid sequences. So in this particular example I'm going to focus in on DNA. Now when I talk about DNA and we talk about how things will change, what we can look at is that if we had a common ancestor and that common ancestor had a series of A's, T's, C's, and G's, as that um, organism passes its genes on to the next generation, there may be some changes, some slight mutations that occur. And eventually we will have different organisms with different DNA sequences. Now, in this particular instance, I'm only showing a handful of generations, so we would expect this to all be within the same species, and we would be able to see that there are, these are variations within a species. But if we were to look at very different species, what we would do is we could look at a situation like histones. Histones are proteins that DNA wrap around that are found inside the nucleus. So they're common proteins that are found in eukaryotes. And if we were to look at different species and we examine their DNA structure, we will find that there are large regions of DNA that are heavily conserved. And when we look at those conserved regions, they're pretty much going to be the same. Those are the darker grade area. And then what we'll find is that there are some other bases that we find. In this particular case, we're looking at amino acids. Uh, there are other amino acids that have a degree of variation. And the key piece here is that the more differences there are, the more distantly related the two species are. So if I was to take two organisms like a human and a chimp, both primates, I'm going to expect there to be a lot of similarities. And as you look here, you'll see that they're basically the same in all of those variable regions that we see here. And in fact, if I look at that top line, the bottom line, the human and chimp, I see very few differences. As opposed to if I compare the human to the mouse, the mouse is more distantly related to us than a chimp is, we see much greater variation. And so we can examine genomes and compare genomes, compare specific proteins or specific DNA sequences that code for proteins, and we can get a sense of how closely or how distantly related two organisms are. Another piece of evidence that we can use are anatomical evidence. And we're going to group those into two uh, groupings here. First, we're going to just uh, talk about skeletal structures. The ones that are shown here, the human forearm, a dog's forelimb, a bird's wing, and a whale's forelimb, these are all forelimbs of vertebrates. And so because these are all forelimbs of vertebrates, there is a similar pattern in the bones where we have one upper arm bone, two lower arm bones, and then many wrist bones followed by digits. These are examples of homologous structures. They have a very similar underlying pattern of evolutionary history for these, but we have very different adult forms and different adult functions. These are homologous structures and they suggest a common ancestor uh, that all of these organisms evolved from. 
We can also look at other types of physical structures, such as vestigial structures. And vestigial structures are just that. They're vestiges of the past. They are structures that really have no or a significantly reduced function in modern day organisms. So this first example I'm showing you guys is the vestigial hip bone and hind limbs of a whale. And so whales obviously do not walk on land, do not walk with hind limbs, but we do still find vestigial hip bone structures in the skeletons of whales. We also see in humans vestigial structures such as goosebumps. So when we look at human skin, what we'll see is that when we get cold or when we get scared, we get that adrenaline rush and we have all of our hair stand up. If we were a very furry creature, this would make us much larger, puff our fur out so that we would stay a little bit warmer, or puff our fur out so it would be a little bigger against a possible threat. Obviously, that really doesn't do much for us right now, but it shows a vestige of our past. So why do we rely on multiple lines of evidence? Why am I telling you about molecular evidence and anatomical evidence when we develop a theory? Well, theories by their very definition are something that unify a wide array of pieces of evidence. Also, if you only use a single piece of evidence when building up your model, it may lead you astray. And in fact, we know that anatomy alone can sometimes lead to mistakes. Historically speaking, when we go back into the 1700s and 1800s and even the early 1900s, when a classification of organisms was done, it was done strictly using anatomical structures in part because we had limited other evidence that we could use. So when we look at a structure like a pill bug and a pill millipede, we would say, oh, look at these things. They look remarkably similar. But now because we can do molecular um, evidence and we have other evidence, we can see that even though they appear very similar, this is because of convergent evolution. That what we're seeing is that there's similar evolutionary pressure on these two uh, groups of organisms in their given habitat, they have very similar evolutionary pressure, and even though they don't share a very recent common ancestor, the selective pressure has led to a very similar physical form. And uh, so we don't want to just rely on anatomy alone. We do look at some geographic distribution, we look at molecular evidence, and we look at other pieces of evidence, as many as we can, when building our model of how closely related organisms are. Obviously, these two organisms are related because all living things are, but they are much more closely related to organisms that do not share these physical structures that are so obvious, and their physical forms are due to convergence. Another example of evidence that we use is developmental similarities. And so here we have a variety of vertebrates. And if you look at that top line, if I was to shuffle those around, it would, you'd be pretty hard pressed to figure out which of those on that line one would go with a fish and which would go with a hog and which would go with a rabbit and which would go with a human. It'd be pretty hard for you to come up with which of those first early embryological development stages goes with the, the creatures on three on the bottom. And the reason for this is that developmental similarities relate to our molecular similarities. There are many developmental genes that are cons heavily conserved throughout vertebrates, and as a result, early embryological development shows a great deal of similarities. So when we're looking at two creatures and we're trying to figure out if they share a common ancestor, sometimes de developmental milestones Stones. Points along development are really important to help us. When we look at all of the animals in the animal kingdom and we try to figure out how phyla of animals are related to one another, some phyla share uh, very similar developmental structures even though their physical forms and their adult forms end up being quite different. So developmental similarities also serve as a nice piece of evidence. The next piece of evidence we're going to talk about is fossils. And so this here is a fossil of Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik is considered the first of our tetrapods, one of the first organisms that would have walked out of water back in the Devonian time. And when we find structures like this, it actually gives us a context for a lot of the anatomical structures that we look at. So for example, we look around now and we know that um, you know we're obviously vertebrates and we know that there's organisms that are tetrapods that walk along on four limbs. But the question is, what were the characteristics that were present when the tetrapods emerged from the water? By finding fossils, it allows us to give us a time and a place 
and sets which characteristics were shared at that point as opposed to ones that evolved later. Also using these fossils, it allows us to build models of the creatures in their time and place. So we can use the fossils of Tiktaalik to have artist rendering and models built of structures like this. Now, obviously the color is a bit of a guess, but uh, it gives us the, that ability to build a model of what Tiktaalik looked like uh, in its time and place. The next thing we talk about is laboratory evidence. And when we talk about laboratory evidence, we're talking about experiments where we make some, uh, some comparisons. So a lot of the molecular pieces that I talked about earlier would fit under that line. But another good example of a theory that came together as a result of a collection of different laboratory experiments was that from Lynn Margolis. Lynn Margolis came up with the model of endosymbiotic theory. And endosymbiotic theory suggests that modern day eukaryotes evolved from a community of prokaryotic organisms. So how do we build that model? Well, first off, we look and see structures like chloroplasts look like small photosynthetic bacteria. Structures like mitochondria look like small aerobic bacteria. And then when we look more closely, we can use laboratory evidence like looking at chloroplasts and looking at mitochondria more closely and then comparing them to those bacteria. So first of all, we know that both chloroplast and mitochondria have DNA and the DNA that we find in them is very similar to DNA that we find in bacteria. We also know that they have ribosomes in them and the ribosomes are much more uh, bacterial ribosomes as opposed to the ribosomes that you find in eukaryotes. We can also look at their membrane structure and it turns out that if you take a cell like a photosynthetic algae and you engulf it, you're going to have an extra membrane layer that wraps around that structure. And by analyzing the membrane structures and the multiple layers outside of a chloroplast, outside of a mitochondria, you can actually make some comparisons uh, with that process that would have led to the endosymbiosis, the engulfing without digesting those cells. And so when we look at all of those pieces together, we can do a lot of those com molecular comparisons. We can look at, do a lot of that analysis. We can also look at modern day symbiotic relationships like a paramecium bursaria that engulfs photosynthetic algae and then use them very much like chloroplasts. Or we can look at termites taking in their endosymbionts that actually are the ones that digest wood. And we can do a variety of different molecular experiments and laboratory experiments that help us uh, support this model for how the first eukaryotes could have come about. Next, we'll talk about field observations. And I mentioned Darwin earlier on, and really it it's pretty obvious that field observations were one of the first things that led to the model of evolution that we use, model of evolution by natural selection. And so what Darwin saw in his travel around the world, which included to the Galapagos, was he was observing very similar organisms on different islands. And then it turned out that he proposed that the reason that there was variation was because that each of the different finches evolved to a slightly different niche on the different islands. Now, there are modern day scientists out there, uh, such as Peter and Rosemary Grant, who have been uh, researching on the Galapagos, Galapagos for the last few decades. And what they've been doing is they have been catching birds, measuring their beaks, analyzing DNA, and then releasing those birds and documenting the variation that exists on those birds on the different islands. This type of analysis in the field allows us to connect the selective and evolutionary pressures that are on these species in their given environment and model how different shifts um, and specifically in the case of the Galapagos, things like droughts can lead to a shift in specific traits as a result of those selective pressures. So now that we've come to the close, so hopefully uh, you will be able to put together certain things. Uh, after this video, you should be able to communicate scientific information that common ancestry and biological evolution are supported by multiple lines of empirical evidence, which include molecular, anatomical, developmental similarities, inherited from common ancestors, we call those homologies, and seen through fossils and laboratory and field observations.
Also, there's a couple of other things you should know. Some specific examples you should be able to cite would be those of endosymbiosis by Lynn Margolis. Also, if given some specific genomes, you could do a comparison. And also, if you were given vestigial or skeletal structures, you could highlight those pieces of evidence. All right, I hope that helps everybody out, and I will talk to you again in a future video soon.